So I'll give you a few more seconds. Get that, that money, you use that private key, you can have that money, but not anymore. Now we're off. Okay, very good. So this is the amount of shoe boxes in Bitcoin. Right, one coin, blah, blah, blah. Your money is stored in one of those shoe boxes, but this is the amount of possible shoe boxes that are sitting in Times Square. In fact, that many shoe boxes, I think, will go to the moon beyond, right? That's a, big, that's a huge number. I don't think the human brain is even, uh, has the capability to conceptualize that number. It's a very big number, but that is the key space of actually that's not the key space. That is 2 to the 168th power. The private key space is 2 to the 256th power, which is a much bigger number than that. However, the public key space is only 2 to the 160th power, as my uh, high IQ friend over there had informed me a few minutes ago. And um, so what, what that really means is that uh, there's public keys that correspond to more than one private key, which is uh, interesting. All right, so what the, the what all that private key is 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 randomness, right? That is just the, ideally it's just randomness. You, the money is stored, the the custody is in the randomness, in, in one level, right? There's, there's another level we'll get to. So how what is randomness, right? This is a a, what, a very common thing for kind of. I guess like Java-based or in-app browser uh, random number generators is that they'll use the the entropy of the uh, entropy is not a good word to use at low level because there's no real meaning to entropy, but I mean maybe a lot of people understand it. But they'll use um, the, the the mouse points on the screen as random points, or they'll use the timing. And you see it says or type some random characters. Actually, it's not the characters that they're using uh, for the randomness, I don't believe. It's the amount of time that's uh, elapsing between the, key, the, the keystrokes, which is in the milliseconds, right? If you have a, a timer that's to the like 12th decimal, then that, it's kind of hard to gain that. Um, so basically, they're taking that randomness and they're turning it into a Bitcoin. There's no money in this one. They're turning this into a uh, Bitcoin address. Um, so other ways you can generate randomness are with dice rolls. Uh, so I believe you would need uh, 46 dice rolls for 256 bits of entropy, which the kind of 256 bits of entropy is the kind of minimum viable standard for uh, security in Bitcoin. Uh, so you need 46 dice rolls, and the idea is that that number that you're generating, right, whether it's this, uh, the random is generated by the mouse clicking or the T keystrokes or these dice rolls. This is a number that has never before been seen in human history and will never be seen again in human history unless you choose to reveal it. So if you roll a die 46 times, right, that's 6 to the 46th power, that number that you generated there, never before in human history has anyone ever seen that number and never again in human history will anyone, you know, at least pre-quantum, you know, we can talk about that later maybe. Uh, will that number ever be seen again in human history? If you were to enter that number in Google, you will never see, the zero results will come up because you are the first human being that's ever encountered that number. Never before. If that's not the case, then that is not a random number and uh, do not put money behind it. Uh, the same is true with a coin flip. You have to flip the coin 256 times and that is 256 bits of entropy. And should you do that, that binary, right, just heads of zero, tails of one, that combination of zeros and ones will have never before been seen in human history. And so you can feel safe to put your life savings behind it. No problem. <coughs> Easy fun. And so this is just the um, how a private key, it, it, we're not really showing how those coin flips will be generated into a private key, but uh, you know, super cool math is done and stuff. And uh, so this is a random private key, and this shows how the random private key gets into the public key, which you can reveal to the world, and all they can do is pay you. The only thing they can do is pay you. And probably most of you have heard of this, you know, years and years and years ago, but 
you would be very surprised if people call you up and they want to put all this money in and they have no idea. And I'm sure a couple of you, you know, if you're embarrassed, it's fine, it's really very smart. But they have no idea how this works. They have no idea. They're like, well, can we just give it to you and you can hold that money? Which, you know, I guess you can, but it, with Bitcoin, this is sovereign wealth. This is sovereign wealth. You can hold your own money. You can secure it. I know Mount Gox has happened and all these things have happened. It's very scary and the brave new world is a little intimidating to get into. The reality is, is that with Bitcoin, you can secure your wealth to a degree that has never before been seen. You can secure your assets like nothing before in human history, way beyond gold, right? Because gold, it's there somewhere, taking up the real estate. Maybe you build a big vault in front of it, but if uh, you know somebody mean comes with guns and tanks and bombs, they can come get the gold, right? This is secured behind the map, and you can have all the guns and tanks and bombs and all the mean people. They can never take your money, ever. So it's the most secure, uh, the highest level of security for sovereign wealth in the history of humanity. Just one of the many reasons why crypto is a complete game changer for uh, human economic activity. It's great, you're going to want it. So here's the different uh, type of public key addresses, and it corresponds to different type of private keys, essentially. Um, Bitcoin are, are uh, well, as we explained, you know, the private key is what's scarce. Bitcoin don't really exist. They're Bitcoin and they're not. It doesn't really exist, it's just, you know, just marks on the ledger somewhere. But what exists is your ability to prove the authority to spend it, and you're doing this through a, through a program, essentially. So these are different types. This is uh, the first and original and most basic type of Bitcoin address, a uh, paper public key hash. Uh, uh, well, I'm not that smart to get into an adventure there because I'll be called out by some of these great people here. But um, that's just a very, kind of basic uh, 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 program that, that proves that you have access to that public key hash. And what, the second one is very interesting because this is um, take to script hash, right? And this is, the, this is a, a Bitcoin address format that enables uh, much more complex custodial structures, uh, which I think we have. And then the, the third one, I think we have an example of this. The third one is a new type of key format, which is just an alternative for pay to script hash that, um, has some added efficiencies, mostly that uh, it eliminates the capital letters, so there's no, uh, less ambiguity or less potential ambiguity between, um, you know, capital W and lowercase W, and it's, uh, I think there's other advantages as well. I know there's other advantages as well, but it's kind of superfluous at this point. Um, so this is what a, a standard Bitcoin transaction is doing. Uh, you're basically signing the, the signing the transaction to prove you're broadcasting that, you're proving to the network that the public key that you're signing the corresponding transaction to, that you own that public key and ownership is just possessing it. So, you know, if someone steals it from you, they own the public key as far as the network is concerned. Uh, you know, maybe some other networks um, will censor this, but with Bitcoin, I think we're far beyond the point of no return where if you lose your money, it's lost forever. It doesn't matter who you know, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how much money you have, uh, it's gone. Um, so if you sign the transaction with a valid signature, you can move the funds no matter what, period. Uh, and then a multi-signature, uh, so this is probably the most, uh, this is the most useful, and probably, I don't know if it's the most basic, but the most useful, most commonly used uh, um, pay and strip hash address format. And this is a multi signature transaction. I'll try to run through the rest quickly so there are some questions. Um, basically, you have an embed structure where uh, I'm sure most of you are well familiar with this, but M is the number of signatures necessary to validate the transaction, and N is the number of possible valid signatures. Uh, there are current limits, I think the theoretical limits to M of N for Bitcoin at least are, are really out there, but right now, I think maybe it only extends to 15, but I'm not sure. Maybe that's changed already. But but you can't really do like a 999 out of 10,000 yet. You probably maybe you can someday, or maybe you can today. And I'm just you know, it's hard to keep up in this space. So uh, please cut me some slack. 
so basically, the most common is obviously two of three. So the three of us start a business, and we're the board of directors, and uh, the treasury is behind this transaction, and two of us need to sign off on any transaction for it to be even possible to, to move. And um, uh, yeah, there's more advanced uh, hash, uh, uh, scripts as well, but I think that pretty much covers it. So there's uh, um, something I've seen from some confusion between uh, multi-signature and Shamir Secret. Uh, Shamir Secret is, is much older than Bitcoin. It's a, a kind of a, a cryptographic um, uh, way that you, you, can, you can share not just Bitcoin keys, but many, many secrets. And here's kind of the very base level math behind it. But it should be noted that these are very different things. Multisig is not Shamir Secret. Um, many, many more people, at least in the past, maybe not anymore, had been familiar with Shamir Secret than familiar with kind of how Multisig script works. And what I found from you know the fantastic high IQ people at all these wonderful banks, fantastic institutions, they're great. And uh, so basically, if you have a point of knowledge, right? One, if you have one piece of information. There can be kind of infinite lines that pass through, or infinite, uh, see, you know, other secrets. I guess is the lines representing the private key, but it could represent a bunch of things. Infinite pieces of information. But once you have two points, there's only one key that can pass through that essentially. Um, so you can you can have a bunch of secrets, but if any two reconcile, the private key is revealed. And the main difference, the main kind of uh, from a security from a custody standpoint, the reason why Shamir's secret is obsolete and insecure is because once those pieces of information are reconciled, the public key, the private key is revealed to, to all participants. And thus, in that time between the revelation and the uh, transaction, uh, someone can rob you. And you know, it's nice if you trust your business partner, but you don't need to trust your business partner anymore with, uh, with Bitcoin. And uh, this is something that is have to go back to time and time and time again. Uh, next time we come, I'm sure we'll put it in a little more concise order. But this is something we go back to a lot. And that is, when it comes to security, not just crypto security, um, well, I should say that I track it like kind of the foundation of the entire business, the thesis from the beginning has been security. Uh, at one point, the CTO had said to me many years ago that we were a security company with a, uh, an exchange module on top. The, every single decision that's made, all the business processes, um, really, if you were internal, you could see that it's almost to a ridiculous degree, that some people think at least, but everything is done through the filter of, of security. And you know, uh, uh, luckily, we've never had any compromise at, at all, any backdoor compromise at all. Uh, I mean, people's accounts have been hacked, and we're doing, um, we're adding features to make that less likely, less possible. You know, but we have had some uh, minor compared to other other exchanges. Not that I want to mention names, but we have had some front door compromises, but we've never had any kind of uh, back door issue. But from an internal perspective, it, it kind of makes the company less agile. It makes it uh, than would be desired because. There are tremendous redundancies internally. The, the, uh, everything is passed through that filter. And the reality is that security and usability and security and convenience are mutually exclusive. Right? They're on the spectrum. And maybe somebody has some theoretical exception to this rule, but I, I don't think it exists. And you can imagine that when you leave your house in the morning, you could just leave the front door open. right? And when you come home, it's going to be very convenient, because you don't even have to open the door. It's already open for you. Or you could bolt it shut with, uh, you could weld it shut, get a big steel plate that weighs a thousand pounds and weld it shut. But when you come home, it's not going to be very convenient, but I can almost guarantee no one's going to break in your house while you're gone, right? And that's kind of the idea with, I, I believe, security in general. Um, so these are, these are just different ways that you can uh, uh, more conveniently store your private keys. Um, <coughs> We probably should discuss first kind of the idea of these mnemonics, right? So what's happening here, uh, bit 32, right? Mnemonic standard? So what's happening here is you have these words on the bottom, right? These words are random. Uh, you know, I think that in the diceware key space, there's uh, 
776 possible words in the standard dice word dictionary. So what we're saying is that there's that 776 base to the 12th power uh, levels of entropy, which I believe is well above two to the 256. So if it's truly random, which it should be, right, then these words are, uh, uh, are the randomness, right? These words represent the randomness. And you run these words, um, or any words, through this uh, uh, unified standard, the 32 uh, standard, and you're going to get a Bitcoin private key out of them. So those words are a Bitcoin private key. And if you protect those words, you protect the money. And so one thing you can do, uh, Frank Wong, one thing you can do is you can memorize those words. And actually a friend of mine who it used to be not so much money, but now he's probably one of the richest men on earth. And his, the vast, vast, vast majority of his wealth is stored in his brain. He has wear shoes with holes in it. He rides a bicycle. And the vast, vast, 99.5% of his wealth, last I checked, which I don't check too often, it was completely in his brain. And let me tell you, this man is an extremely wealthy man. Extremely wealthy. So this is a new paradigm for humanity. Now, this guy can walk through customs naked in 10 years through the most repressive uh, regime in human history. And there's not a thing that they can do until they you know, read his brain and consume. But right now, or hopefully never, but there's not a thing that they can do to even know that that wealth exists. That wealth is entirely in the brain. And so you can take those, uh, you know, obviously any way that you can securely store those 12 words, maybe you want more words than that, uh, but 12 should be enough, if they're truly random. Any way that you can store 12 words, you can store your wealth. And there's a lot of ways to do that, as you probably know. Here's some standard ways. Uh, this is a hardware wallet. Um, just like that Fabian, very smart guy, was describing. Uh, I believe it has the same type of thing, some secure element. I don't really know how that works. Uh, but, you know, the keys are on there, secure element, it's all cool and everything. But what really, actually, many of you have a ledger wallet, what you know, is the, the money's not really on that ledger wallet, right? The money's on a piece of paper that comes with the ledger wallet. And on that piece of paper, you write 12 words. That's where the money is. The money's not on there. The money's also on there. But what's really more important is that 12 words that you're writing on that piece of paper, that's where the money is. Um, then you have the other paper wallets, other pieces of paper. Uh, you know, put them in a safe or... But yeah, what you really, I mean, the paper, the paper is very temporary, right? That paper will be destroyed. That paper is as good as gone. Is that going to last 100 years at best? You get the best paper ever? You last 500 years? You know, it's, it's super temporary. Uh, but you can get something like this. Um, this is a new product from Ledger as well. Obviously, you don't need to use their product. You can etch words onto a piece of metal, and it's super easy. Uh, but essentially, what we have there is that your uh, somebody's put the words into this uh, crypto steel product, um, bolted them in, and now their seed is on a piece of metal that is fireproof and uh, hopefully rust resistant. I think. And uh, that is very durable, right? And the, the wealth, the tremendous sovereign wealth is on that piece of metal behind those words. Um, so this is another uh, uh, script type uh, smart contract in Bitcoin called uh, in lock time. Um, this is just from the code, but, but this isn't really a transaction. But what that allows you to do is to create a Bitcoin transaction that um, has a timer on it, essentially, right? So you can either use, uh, um, there's a standard in Bitcoin mining that people, that each block that's mined is a timestamp, and there's a, you know, that they, they, it's the time that, that your trend, that the, that the network accepts as the correct time is the um, median of the last 11 with the outliers removed, something like that. But basically, like, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain is also functioning as a clock. And so you can put a time into your transaction, and you can put private keys in there, and those keys will not be valid until any time has passed. You can also use block height uh, instead of the time. But um, something that someone else who uh, I have great respect for has is basically a will. So this guy needs the vast majority of the money to Bitcoin, you know, well over 90%, and he has a transaction that he, I believe he uh, uh, has most of his funds in, and he has keys, and then someone else has a key, you know, a family member that he trusts. And should uh, a certain amount of time pass, the assumption is should he die, should he die, 
uh, in a certain amount of time pass, a second key becomes valid after six months or a year or some amount of time. You don't want to put it too far in the future because you never know what's going to happen. It could be a fork that uh, makes your transaction valid. It would be bad. But essentially, that functions as a will. I don't need lawyers. You know? so it's, you know, lawyers are great. I love lawyers. You know, they're fantastic. They give me tremendous value in my life throughout the years, I must say. Uh, but basically, the guy has a will for a massive amount of money that uh, exists entirely outside of the domain of any lawyers and is governed, his will is governed completely by that. This is an HD wallet, so this is a hyper or hierarchical deterministic wallet. Um, essentially, how it works very basically is that you have a private key, you add a nonce to the private key, one, two, three, four, five. You only need to remember one private key. You only need to remember one mnemonic seed. That one mnemonic seed can correspond to trillions of, well, you know, theoretically, it can correspond to infinite numbers, nearly, of uh, other private keys. So you remember one, and you remember millions and millions of private keys, and that's very helpful, especially from an enterprise perspective. Because, you know, all you smart people can probably uh, bring smart magic. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I have four minutes for questions. Thank you. Great, that's great.